The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. All right, so hey everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of the Tent Sula podcast, brought to you by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, for those who are not familiar with the AAPRP, uh, we were actually founded by Kwame Nkrumah in 1968, uh, with our objective being Pan Africanism. Um, I know a lot of you guys have different variations of what Pan Africanism, so I'll go ahead and define what the AAPRP definition of African uh, Pan Africanism is, and that is. Uh, a totally liberated and unified Africa under scientific socialism. Um, so before we start every episode, we like to dedicate uh, each episode to one of our ancestors, two of our ancestors, uh, one is being Robert F. Williams and the other being Mabel Williams. Um, and as you can see, I'm joined here with my comrade, uh, Evan. And we also have a special guest with us, Ajamu, a longtime organizer with the AAPRP, an author, a dedicated father. Um, and today we'll be discussing his book, Book, uh, a guide for organizing defense against white supremacist patriarchal and fascist violence. Um, so we're glad to have you on this episode, Adamu, and we look forward to to diving into your book and, and all the goodies uh, that that comes with it. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you both, comrades. Continue the good work. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> no, no, my. Comrade Jeffrey, a little bit about you. So, so a little bit more about yourself and how does that lead up to the to the writing of this book? Yeah, well, you know, we we have a lot of work that we struggle to do, and over the years, um, I've engaged in some pretty intense battles. I've I've gone face to face in organizing against armed white supremacists. Um, we've done a lot of work in neighborhoods, attempting to get people engaged in the political work around our Pan-Africanist objective that we believe will, you know, liberate us. So I took notes for years and decided about three years ago, you know, I think I can write some of this down in a way that can help people figure out how to go about engaging in work to empower our people and other pr oppressed communities. So that was really it. it was just like thinking of a how to create a toolkit that people can use that can help them figure out how to organize in neighborhoods outside of the capitalist system, you know, independent in ways that can help us empower ourselves and, and get free on a worldwide basis. Oh, that's a good point. And uh you know, like we have to say, and and I know I'm just going through the book. You talk about how you want want people to self organize, it. and there's one section on things on page 17, 18 about uh, European Europeans who want to organize for justice. And you might and there's might be some people like, well, why you talk about why are you talking about Europeans? We're Pan Africans. It's about about us. So why are you talk about them? So let's get. I mean, you mentioned that I'm talking about. Uh, strategy like if if you can't engage with the majority then then that then that's a uh, that's a setback so can you talk more about why uh, you would have just that little section about it yeah i mean i think that resulted uh from my again my experience in 2012 13 i uh, started initiating a chapter for the all african people's revolutionary party in the state of oregon i was living up there then and if people don't know you know, Portland, Oregon, where we live, it's the most European, the whitest city in the U.S. with a population of 500,000 or more. But there are Africans there. And I, I wanted to test that. So what I found are a couple of things. One, that um, our people respond better in that type of environment because you really have no other choice. You know, when you, when you go, I live in California, you know, you talk about us organizing to get free people like, okay, whatever. You know, I, I, I see Will Smith living down the street. I can be like him. But when you're in a situation like Portland, it's, you know, people are much clearer about the intensity of the oppression. So that was one thing. 
The other thing is that there's so many Europeans who are, you know, a lot of them are overtly racist, and, but many of them are like well-intentioned, but they don't know what to do. Either way, either way, it doesn't matter which group you're talking about. Um, it It's illogical to think that we are going to organize ourselves in societies like this one where we're outnumbered without something being done to address these people. You know, we can't or we're not in a vacuum apart from them. And if you study our history, every movement we've had in this country, because the book is focused on connecting organizing us in this country to connect to our work in Africa, right? So every movement we've had in this country, the working class European uh, communities have been moved to organize against us. If you look at the civil rights movement in the 60s, the white supremacist groups were made up of working class Europeans who were oppressed by capitalism also, but the system has always convinced them, as Lyndon Johnson said, if you want to get the white man to listen, just tell him he's better than a Negro. So, you know, we know this is true. This is the history. So, you know, that has to be addressed. And I'm, and it's not saying, as I say in the book, we're not the ones who have to organize them. They have to organize themselves. But if this manifesto can help them figure out how to do that, then that just makes our work that much easier. They're not in our way. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that, too. Um, I just had one one question, too, because I've been hearing a lot of discourse around, um, especially those who are organizing, um, even those who aren't organizing say this um, in regards to, oh, well, you're telling people to join organizations. Well, uh, what if someone just wants to join, uh, you know, uh, organization that's for the Democratic Party or for the Republican Party or whatever the case is, right? What if that's what they want to organize? Like, what, what would your response be to that, given the book and, um, you know, and that's calling for people to organize? Um, with that being said. Yeah, no, that's a great question. They're all great questions. Um, I appreciate both of you. But, you know, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, our position has always been join any organization working for our people. And I and we realize, and I've seen it for 37 years, like people, are, well, the, that organization is no good. I, why are you telling people to join that? Why are you telling people to join the NAACP, blah, blah, blah. But those people that say that are missing the point entirely. And the point is this, like if you don't have a car, I use this analogy a lot. If you don't have a car and you're trying to get somewhere, then the first thing you need to do is get a car, any kind of car, because you, right now you can't go anywhere. So, you know, if you don't have a car, you sit there talking about, well, that car is not good enough. I don't like that car. You don't even know what you're talking about. The first thing you have to do is get something that moves, moves you from point A to point B. And then while you're doing that, then you can begin to make a proper assessment. Now you can say, well, I need something that has more horsepower, that has better air conditioning, a better sound system, whatever, the, more leg room, whatever the case may be. But the only way you truly understand that is once you're moving. And the only way that happens is stand how to properly organize our people unless you're engaged in that process. I mean, this is clearly a scientific approach by saying this. You know, the people that say, well, I don't need to be in an organization or this organization is not good enough. That organization is not good enough. You can't do it by yourself. If you could, I don't know what you're waiting on. I wish you would just do it. Make us free if you can do it by yourself. So clearly, no question from a scientific standpoint, we have to be organized on a collective level. And the only way people are going to understand what type of organization we need is by being engaged in organization. Once you do that, then you understand, okay, this is not for me. I need to be doing this. But if you're not engaged in anything other than keyboard warrior work on, uh, on social media, then all you understand are the bourgeois ideas in your head. And I don't care how mad people get saying that they can't refute it. You know, there's no way to refute that. You have to be engaged in organizations. So you think I'm, we don't need to argue with people if they say with well, the Democratic Party, let them get involved in the Democratic Party. If they're serious about liberating our people, then we should encourage them to work hard in the Democratic Party because the harder they work, our position is that eventually they'll come to realize this is not the vehicle that's going to get us free. And that's how they'll come to understand they need something else. We don't have to tell them that. They can understand that on their own, just through their own practical experience. 
And a follow-up point is that if, if you don't like any of the organizations, you can make your own. Right. Absolutely. You got to do that. I got, this is something, you know, we never stop having to explain this to people because I know you all know it and I experience it all the time. Well, I don't need to be in an organization. Well, you don't. Well, how are you going to liberate our people? Like, I'll give you a, a, a perfect example. Um, these Africans that organized this um, not effing around coalition with the guns, marching with the guns. Now, they march. I'm sure they have great intentions. And, I, and again, I'm speaking as someone who has tussled with white supremacists. I'm not just someone talking about this from afar. So my assessment of that is that I'm not going to be impressed if you march to a Ku Klux Klan headquarters and you leave and the Ku Klux Klan headquarters is still there. I'm not going to be impressed by that. My, what I want to see happen is the elimination, not only of the Ku Klux Klan, but the neo-Nazis, the police, the U.S. imperialist military, all of these uh, racist, white supremacist, patriarchal, oppressive, pro-capitalist maintaining organizations. And so how is that going to happen? That's not going to happen by 1,500 of us marching with guns and the vast majority of our people are not even involved in organization. That the 1,500 of us cannot, even if they have the best of intentions, that will never be what we need to solve the problem. That's why that's all they could do is just march there, stand there for a few minutes or whatever they did and leave. The Ku Klux Klan is not concerned about that. They've been around for uh, 150 years. You think they're concerned about us? That's the first time that we have, come there and stood in front of them. That's happened before. We don't, if we study our history, we know that. We've always stood up to the Ku Klux Klan. They're not concerned about that. What we have to do is get organized to the point where we can wipe them out. And that's going to take more than 1,500 people. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think even to your point about the uh, NFAC, the Knife and Around Coalition, um, some people even like to use them as a benchmark, right? to say that uh, this is the stuff we need to be doing and stuff like that, which is which is all the way backwards, which kind of ties into a question that kind of came to my mind. I know early in the book, you talk about um, political education and the importance of it. Um, you know, some people kind of reiterated some of the statements I was making earlier. Like, you know, what, why do I need political education? That's not going to pay me. That's not going to give me money. Why do I need political education? Maybe you could talk to the importance of that and tie it into um you know, why it's important and, you know, the necessity of it. Right. I mean, and this is everything you just said, I think, ties together. You know, the people who are saying, well, that's what we need to be doing. Like when people talk like that, then that tells me immediately that they're not an organization because the people who would say something like that are people who are satisfied with idealism or not, uh, not idealism, but uh, symbolism, you know, symbolic, uh, instances impress them because they're that's they're not involved at all so something that looks good is enough for them but for those of us who are involved we know we need so much more and whatever we do political education has to be the foundation of it organized political education and when we say that we don't just mean reading books because i know a lot of people are confused they think well you're just saying i gotta read books that ain't gonna get us free political education is a process you all it's the reading books is part of it and then also you have criticism self-criticism which we've learned in the aprp from our wonderful comrades in the Democratic Party of Guinea, the party of Sacred Terrain, and democratic centralism, which is another tool we've learned. All of these things together represent the process of political education. So what you have is ongoing ideological training that's happening. We're, not only are we just learning about our history and learning about our struggle, but we're learning and practicing skills to implement what we learn in real life. And that's what this manifesto is designed to do. So when we do that, you can't do that based on ignorance. You can't just, because you have a, a good idea, you have to understand why we, the forces that are oppressing us and how we can get together to cease that from happening. Because if you don't have that, then the enemy is well-versed and very skilled at doing everything they can to demoralize you. And they'll get you to a point where you're like, why am I doing that? Like I'm 59 years old. You know, and I talk to people my age every day and they're all demoralized. You know, that's what capitalism does to us. You know, they're demoralized because they, you've been through a divorce and the other person took everything and 
these people disrespected you and your job has disrespected you and all this has been happening for years. And so all these people know how to do is just say, well, all I'm trying to do is just get something for myself. And I get that. That's exactly where you'll end up if you don't understand the forces, the organized forces that created this scenario where this person took everything from you and your job disrespected you. All oh, this is a part of somebody else's plan. And the reason why I don't suffer from that is because I understand what's happening here and how it's happening and why it's happening and what it's designed to do. But the only reason why I understand it is because I've spent the last 40 years, four decades engaging in this process so that I could understand it. And so I raised my daughter understanding these things. So that's why, unlike a lot of my friends, I'm not estranged from my daughter. She can't stand me or no, we, she's in the same organization all of us are in, doing the same work we're doing. We talk every day. And that's, I credit this process for that. You know, it has nothing else to do. It has nothing to do with anything else other than engaging. So we all understand the forces that work around us and how we engage them so that we can defeat them and create a better reality for future generations. That's, a, that's definitely what I remember. And, and is this, there, there, there are definitely times where I feel where I'm, when you're doing different meetings or you, you know, people and you're just thinking, oh, why am I doing this? Why? I got this to do. I got work. I got school. I got this. And, and this really something. I'm, and speaking of, 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 of like thinking about what the enemy is doing, like I know, and there's a particular section we talk about the uh, the whole part of security culture and how this gets reified into some sort of a, uh, uh, I guess like a, to put put on a pedestal in certain organizations. Like, can you speak on why why do you think that's that, that aspect of activism or like revolutionary work is has has its flaws or its contradictions. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that. It's tied directly to the last question, I believe. And it's that the reason why we rely on security culture so much in activist circles is because people haven't figured out this question we just discussed. How do we create revolutionaries? This was the question that Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Touré uh, tackled. They wanted to address the question, how do we create revolution? Well, you have to have revolutionaries. Well, how do you create revolutionaries? You have to transform human beings. And this activist culture we exist in now is not even discussing how to transform human beings. So because we don't discuss that, the only thing people have to rely on are the mechanisms available to us through the capitalist system. And that's individualism, distrusting people, elitism, all of these values that are dominant in the system. So since we don't know how to deal with the concept of transforming people, then we think that the solution is, well, you have to prove this to me or you have to do this in order for you to qualify to do this work. You have to you have to represent this and I have to, you know, assume it has to be acceptable to me for me to be able to see you as someone who's uh, valuable enough for me to want to work with you. And my argument in a guide for organizing defense against white supremacist patriarchal and fascist violence is that these are backward approaches to le- working together. And we say that because we understand African culture or revolutionary African personality, as Kwame Nkrumah defined it in consciousness. We understand this. And so our culture is a mass culture. Uh, the mistake many Africans get is we try to approach work. Um, we're working with Europeans, so we try to approach it from their cultural standpoint. But that's not our that's not who we are. We're a mass people like our organizations are mass. The Democratic Party of Guinea was a mass party. The African Party for the Independence of Guinea Bissau, PAIGC, mass party. Popular Movement for the Independence of Angola, mass party. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is a mass party. We're trying to recruit every African in the world into our party. So how are we going to do that when we say, well, you can't participate unless you prove to me this, or you can't participate unless I check into your, you know, if you, if we have the proper political education processes engaged, we will transform people so that we don't have to worry about that because the problem with the security culture approach is it's, as I mentioned in the book, it's done nothing to, we, the, the people who practice those things haven't, done anything to eliminate abuse 
in the organizations, there's still patriarchal abuse against women and women identifying people from the people who practice that stuff. There's still people that snitch to the police in those circles. So they haven't they haven't solved their problem by taking that approach. The only way to address those problems is to transform human beings. And so we're saying political education process is the way to do that. Not all these uh, practices that are based on a premise that you can't trust people. You, that's a backward way to approach organizing people. We're saying we want to, we want, we believe in people. So we want to put in place processes that demonstrate that, not the other way around. And another point that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, you talk, talk about the, you talk specifically about the politicization and in the book, you want to make sure that when people are doing these community, uh, these community defense networks that, that they prevent uh, liberalism from happening. That So what, what would you say are some of the biggest problems to making sure that, that there's like, was basically to combat liberalism? <laughs> right. And I think that, um, you know, these are critical questions you all are asking, because one of the fundamental things that separates us as in Krumitz Tereus from Marxist Leninists or Maoists or, you know, other folks, and they're revolutionaries and we respect them as revolutionaries. But again, we approach revolution from the standpoint of our culture, our African culture. And so when Secretary talked about ideology being a critical component of class analysis, that's very important to us because the question you're raising is crucial to understanding that because the tools that we have um, address that. Like, for example, if you have someone who has involved, who's involved in the work, but they're stealing from the organization or they're doing things that are counter to, you know, productive forward progress in the organization. These are ideological contradictions. So if we don't understand the importance of ideology, we can never properly address those contradictions. So like I mentioned, we practice criticism, self-criticism. So that's a tool to attempt along with the study and everything else to attempt to address these types of contradictions that we all have growing up and participating every day in a society of capitalism where profit is more important than people. So the way we address that is we use, hey, you're doing this. This is unacceptable. Not to say get out of here. We don't want to deal with you, but to say that the only way that we can continue to function with you is we have to figure out how to address these contradictions. And so once you criticize someone, you have a responsibility to help them resolve the contradiction. You can't use the criticism as a hammer or a weapon as is used generally in the society. You have to use it as a tool of support. And so we do that. So I, I always give the example of myself. Like in 1993, my mother's, my mother, my daughter's mother and I divorced. Now, in the capitalist society, the way that typically takes place, because it's individualistic, is that, okay, we're not together, and it's your fault we're not together, so I'm going to do everything I can to destroy you in the process. And, and even people who claim to be revolutionaries and activists engage in this behavior because this is all that we're taught to do. You know, so this is what typically happens. That's not what happened in my scenario. And I would argue it's typically not what has happened in the relationships that have not worked out that I've seen in the process that I've participated in the APRP. Instead, what happened is that our all African women's revolutionary union and the social revolution practices that they have implemented in the party were instituted. And so it wasn't just myself and the sister I was married to getting divorced. It was a community. You know, people love to say it takes a community, but they don't understand what it means in real life. So that means people in your business, you all, because it's not just your individual business. It's the community's business. And so we had to develop an agreement. And that agreement was based on evaluations of the, and, and discussion and assessment of the things that I had done wrong, the things that she had done wrong. And we came to an agreement. And. We've honored that agreement for 33 years, okay, on every level. 
I can give you her contact information, and she can tell you that. I can put you in touch with my daughter, and she can tell you that. We've honored this so much so that today she and I, we just talked earlier today. We've been talking for 33 years. We never stopped talking. We raised our daughter together. She continues to support our movement work, even to the extent that several years ago when she was uh, visited by the Federal Bureau of Investigation because they were concerned about work that that I was engaged in at that time, uh, among many times, uh, and they had my address at her. By the time the person from the FBI contacted me, I'm like, well, what do you want? And they're like, we just have some questions about some of this work you're engaged in. I'm saying, well, I don't have anything to say to you without my attorney. And he said, okay, I, you know, I respect that. But he said, but I just want you to know your ex-wife, we tried to talk to her and she told us to go straight to hell. And I'm like, that's exactly what she's supposed to tell you to do. You know, and, they, and I could tell by the way he was talking to me, he thought because she and I had been divorced, they just thought for sure she would unload and tell him everything. But these people do not understand principled ideological struggle and ideological development. They don't understand that because their their thing is based solely on intimidation and isolation and repression. So they don't understand when we fully learn how to stick together, it, regardless of what obstacles confront us, we're indefeatable. They, they, don't, they don't understand that and we don't understand that. But if we start to practice things this way, we will come to understand it. And the minute we do is the day that freedom is right around the corner for us. Yeah, uh, that that was those are great points, man. That's you're going in, <laughs> but um, yeah. One question I had, uh, you know, I know this book is specifically for Africans in the Western Hemisphere on how to build a guide for um to the to defend against these oppressive systems. Um, but with that being said, I guess you kind of talked about it earlier and tied it into the book. Obviously, is internationalizing the struggle and tying it into the African struggle. Um, so maybe you could you could kind of dive into that because obviously you know there's people out there who believe that. We're just going to do it solely on our own. Um, they obviously haven't read the handbook of revolutionary warfare, where it talks about utilizing contested zones and liberated zones. Um, and historically true is, you know, uh, when you look at the Soviet Union and helping out, uh, you know, Cuba and Cuba helping out Angola and so forth and so on. So maybe you could kind of dive in further into that and, um, you know, how we could use that and, and what does, I'm sorry, this, if this is a loaded question, but what does standing in solidarity with other yeah. people look like as well? Yeah, no, that's that's all outstanding. Um, I think that, you know, Malcolm X very clearly, as he always did, gave a, 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 a wonderful statement about this 64 years ago or 54 years ago, rather, when he said that uh, when a cat has kittens in an oven, you don't call them biscuits. So clearly we're Africans. There's no question about that. And I think the challenge we have right now is this capitalist system has – it's built on exploiting Africa. The wealth in this U.S. United States is based on exploiting Africa. The ability to listen to this podcast is based on African mineral resources. Columbite tantalite supplies the digital technology that allows the Internet to work. So we can go on and on about cocoa, about uh, the car that you drive and the, the materials that built that coming from Central and Southern Africa and the gasoline in your car coming from Nigeria and the phosphates that make the lights that light up your room and all of these things, you know, the aluminum, um, all of that, you know, this entire the wealth of this economy was built on exploiting Africa and it's maintained that way. So because of that, the the capitalist ruling classes, they recognize that they cannot have us connect to Africa because the minute we do that, we're going to start asking questions like, why am I just so happy to, to wear a diamond ring when we should be controlling the diamond industry and using the revenues from that to uplift our people? So they cannot risk having us ever reach that level of consciousness so they have to constantly tell us well africa's poor is suffering nobody wants anything to do with africa you don't want anything to do with africa and so we have had 528 years of this backward miseducation and so the result of that is today you have africans in the u.s talking about well i'm not african i'm indigenous to the western hemisphere with this kind of confusion and you know this is this is the reality that we're faced with today and i was 
talking to a bunch of Africans the other day. They were telling me this. Well, we've been here thousands of years. And I said, okay, well, let's clear this up quickly. How many of you have, because these Africans are paying all these European capitalist country, companies to get these DNA tests, right? So um, since they've done that, I asked them, I said, so how many of you have gotten DNA tests? It was like 20 of them on the call and about 11 of them had done it. I said, so I want to know of you that did that, which one of you have tested, say you've been indigenous to the Western hemisphere for thousands of years. I bet you not one of you, I want to see the test because all of you that are getting these tests, they're saying your family came from Bakongo. They came from Ghana. They came from Nigeria. That's what your tests are telling you because that's what you are African. And the only reason why you don't want to face that is because you're ashamed of your history because you let your enemy miseducate you about who you are. But those of us who know Africa and know Africa's history, we don't ever want to be anything else except African. And so this is the challenge we have getting our people to understand who we are. And that means that for us, you all know this in the APRP, Africa's primary. Like, I'm not concerned about the United States. Outside of the indigenous people getting it, the real indigenous people, the American Indian people, not the frauds who are African and are ashamed to admit it. But I'm not concerned about it outside of them getting their land back. That's my only concern. Other than that, Africa is the primary thing that we're working on. But the question that for this guide that I wrote is what is the role of Africans in the U.S.? And so what I wanted to do, because I've always this has always been a question in my mind, is write something that to to address that. So the organizing toolkit that's in this book that I wrote is designed to facilitate how we in Harlem, in South, what they call South Central LA, in the Bay Area, in SWATs in Atlanta, in Philadelphia, North and South Philadelphia, in Baltimore, in Chicago, South Side, West Side, wherever we are in this backward decadent country, how do we organize our people in those neighborhoods in a way that helps us understand we're African people, even if we're in Chicago or L.A. or the Bay, we're African people. And whatever happens in Africa is what's going to happen with us. And so this is just a mechanism to do that, while at the same time getting racist police off our backs, getting uh, patriarchal predators stopping them from figuring out ways to stop them from oppressing our women identifying people doing all of those things but linking it into the pan-african struggle because when our people rise up organize and rise up which is the work you all know that we're doing in africa i'm going to zimbabwe in a few months to help one of our sister parties there engage in this work and this is what we're doing and so when our people rise up and say you're not stealing our columbite tantalite anymore then we have a role to play here in the snakes because Apple, Samsung, all of these corporations are either based here or they're heavily operational here. So we're the ones that are going to have to shut those operations down to support our people at home. So it has to be a worldwide effort to shut capitalism down. So this is why, you know, this work, yeah, it happens in the neighborhoods in the U.S., that's what the book is talking about. But it's not just isolated to the U.S. It's a worldwide effort. And the only way that will happen is when we get the conscience to understand that we're a worldwide people. And just one more thing about that. This concept that, you know, these xenophobic Africans who are pushing this uh, uh, backward uh, American descendants of slaves narrative, this backward reactionary opportunistic narrative. We just have to call it what it is. You know, and we 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 if they don't like it, we challenge you to to debate the facts around these questions that you are all you're concerned about is making money off of our people's suffering because your analysis that there's somehow some difference between Africans born outside of the U.S. and Africans here is based in absurdity. Do do people understand that when they kidnapped us, they didn't keep our families together? They just randomly kidnapped us. So it's a fact that you have biological relatives in Cuba, in Brazil, in Bolivia. You have biological relatives in all in Honduras, in Mexico, in El Salvador. These are your family, your blood relatives, because they were split off. So how, if you understand that, how stupid is it? You have biological relatives in the Congo, in Ghana, 
in Eritrea. So how, if you know this, how stupid is it for you to be sitting up here talking about, well, I don't know about them Jamaicans. That's clearly somebody else's narrative that's been planted in your head. I just found out because our families are scared. I just found out from research in January that my, my paternal grandfather was born and raised in Jamaica. So what kind of fool would I be? I don't know about them Jamaicans. We're all the same people. Anybody that don't understand that, you know instinctively they don't know anything about their history, period. Exactly. It's, as it, that's that, that capitalist white supremacist uh, propaganda that's just playing off people. And so, you know, we, we met, you mentioned, you talk about the African culture we have and using that for our party. How, in what ways have you just kind of defended that from people say, oh, oh you, you're reading Lenin, oh, you're reading Marx, oh, you're doing this, like, oh, that's, that's your, like, you got to talk about Africa. Like, how do you deal with uh, people who say that uh, that is not African enough for or using not like African epistemology of some sort, or you not dealing with the anti-blackness. As a, there's another point, you know, how yeah. do you respond to that for people who want to organize? And yeah, no, that's excellent. And you know, again, this is another discussion that's happening a lot. And I tell people they get upset, but they can't refute it. I tell people there's really no such thing as anti-blackness. This is anti-Africa. That's what's happening because we're being shot down in. Europe, in Australia, in Canada, in the United Snakes, in Honduras, wherever, because Africa is being exploited. And they cannot afford to have 100 million Africans in Brazil running around free when the entire economy of capitalism is based on exploiting Africa. They cannot risk us because at some point we're going to wake up and understand that. So it's not about, it's, there's no anti-black, these people Studied in Africa, but if you if we if we read and study it, Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all of them studied in Mali in Timbuktu. They were all there. They all got their ideological and rhetorical and philosophical basis in Africa. So there's no anti-blackness. These people know Africa produced some of the best civilizations on earth. They know this. We're the ones that don't know it. So. They, because we are disconnected from our mother, we have accepted this. Well, it's anti. They don't like us because we're black. But that, that is, no, that is, it's not about that. It's about understanding that until as long as long, they have to maintain this disconnect between us and Africa to maintain their system. That's what it's all about. And we're the only people who are trying to think we can liberate ourselves by being disconnected from our culture and our homeland. And culture is, again, it's the critical question. And so, yeah, again, we, we do study Marx. We study Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Mao Zedong, Le Dewan, uh, uh, Kim il Soon, all of them. But our basis is, again, our African culture, Kwame Nkrumah's writings, Sekou Touré's writings, Amilcar Cabral's writings, and the concept of the revolutionary African personality. And for anyone, like, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a, a big intellectual trip like all you have to do is go to africa that's all you have to do is travel there and you can understand the revolutionary african personality you can understand that our culture is collective it's humanist it's egalitarian these are attributes of who we are no matter where we are on earth you all that does not change that and the reason why i say if you go to africa because a lot of this backward nonsense that we learn in this country, it exists only in our heads here. Well, they don't want us in Africa. We're different. That, that only exists in your head here. The minute you step foot in Africa, you understand how corrupt that analysis is because five minutes into it, you realize that you go to the store and there's, there's old men sitting outside of the store, just like they're sitting outside the store in Baltimore or Los Angeles, and they're talking, just like they're sitting outside the store in L.A. talking, and they're talking trash, just like they're sitting outside the store in L.A. and Baltimore talking. The only difference is that they're speaking Wolof, or they're speaking a con, but their mannerisms are 100% the same. That's why it's important we study Miss Fannie Lou Hamer from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee when she went to Guinea with the SNCC delegation in 1964 
and they were the guests of the Democratic Party of Guinea and Sekou Touré there. She came back and she told the young Kwame Touré, who was Stokely Carmichael then, she told him, Stokely, they look just like us. They even hold their babies like us. They talk like us, everything. Yes, because we are the same people. And you don't even know. It's great to learn the languages. Like I've studied a con because I plan to, um, once I retire from this capitalist job and have my pension in a few years, uh, to move home. And so that's great to do that. But you can understand people even if you don't know the language. Like years ago when I went to Cuba with Comrade Nidamu, who's in the Bay Area, we went to Cuba and we were there and there were Europeans on the delegation we went and they spoke fluent Spanish. We didn't speak no Spanish, but we, you know, Cuba's a, a country filled with African people. And so we were everywhere we went, people invited us in their home. We were at, the, at parties. The, the white folks saw us partying with people. And when we had the debrief, they had trouble talking to people. You know, because they would come with these cameras and, you know, our people don't trust no European people with no big camera equipment. Nowhere in the world do we trust that. So they didn't understand that. So when we had the debrief, they were like, well, how are you able to do that? And you don't even speak Spanish. You don't even speak the language. And I told them, that's what you all don't understand about culture. Yes, we don't. Yeah, we, we don't speak the language, but you don't you don't know how to relate to the people. So, yeah, we don't speak Spanish, but you don't speak the language. You don't know what the cultural language is. We do. So we didn't have any problem. We, we, we spent four or five days with this group of sisters, didn't speak a, it, no more than two or three words of Spanish. They didn't speak any English, and we were fine. We had a great time with them because we spoke the same culture, and that's what we have to understand. So when we talk about incrumism, terraism, that's what it's talking about, tapping into our revolutionary African personality and our culture. And, you know, the white left, they don't understand that when we talk like that, but that's okay because we're not talking to them anyway. You know, if they want to understand it, they can study our stuff like we study theirs. But until they do that, we have to do that. And anyone saying, well, socialism is a European concept, they just don't know what they're talking about because the first documented person to talk about capital and surplus labor was an African, Eden Khaldun in the 12th century in Tunisia who talked about that. And a lot of the concepts he taught, Karl Marx references him. So anybody that, you know, people don't know what they're taught. And then they say, well, nationalism is bad, you know, because in Europe's history, nationalism has been bad. But as Kwame Ture told us, Europe's history is not the history of the world. So Sekou Ture talks a lot about this. And he talks about the differences in history. Europe's history is from going from nations to states Africa's history is going from states to a nation. And so we, you know, we understand the differences. Like we don't get caught up in the European analysis of history. That's y'all. Like I tell all the time, they're like, well, nationalism is bad. I'm like, it's bad for y'all. You know, we don't have any Hitler. We don't have a Third Reich. That's not our history. We have a mass history. And the states in Africa are all colonially created and benefit colonialism and capitalism. So we need to eradicate that and create a nation. So don't try to impose your history on us. That's your problem. Y'all need to work that out. You know, whatever what happened in Czechoslovakia splitting up and Yugoslavia splitting up, Serbia, Croatia, that's the history of Europe. That's not our history. And people try to act like it's the same thing. That's not the same thing as what happened in Sudan. We can trace that, the splitting up of Sudan, to the neo-colonial forces and the colonial forces, the situation in Rwanda in the 90s, that's a direct reflection of neo-colonialism. There's no question about that for anyone who's studied it. But if all you know about Rwanda is the movie Don Cheadle and Hotel Rwanda, well, that's why you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you make a great point, too, when you talk about earlier in regards to people reducing things to anti-Blackness, you know, especially with the emergence of things like Afro-pessimism, um, you know, in regards to, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, I can't, you know, we could build solidarity with Cuba, but there's anti-Blackness there, or we could build solidarity with, um, you know, North Africa, but there is anti-Blackness there, you or know, Palestine. My, my, yeah, or Palestine, yeah, you know, we can only, you know, we have to exclude North Africans because, you know, historically they've, they've ex- uh, exuded, quote unquote, anti-Blackness, um, I guess what would what would be your response to that, and uh, in regards to what you written in this book, and, and just in general? Yeah, and 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 that is um actually you know our our Sunday workshop is our topic this Sunday, and and I would respond by saying, 
again, when people talk like that, these are people that are not involved in movement work. I, there, there's an African organization on the East Coast where they were talking about Asians have never stood up for us. And can anybody name any Asian organization that stood up for African people? And I, I immediately just listed like seven or eight Asian. Well, there's Gabriella, there's Anik Bayan, there's Asians for Black Lives Matter, there's the Yellow Guard, there's the Red Guard. There's all kind of Asian organizations that have um, – 50 years ago to present times work with us. Um, when we had a delegation in our Oregon chapter, the APRP, to go to Tanzania in 2016, Anik Bayan and Gabriella, who are two Filipino, radical Filipino organizations, one's for youth, Anik Bayan, the other's for women, Gabriella, they raised $1,000 and gave it to us to, to take to Africa. So, but if you're not, the only reason why I know that and experience that is because I'm involved in organization and the organizational work links me to other organizations doing the same work. If all you're doing is sitting in your ho little hobble, dark hobble on the internet, well, of course you're not going to know that. You don't know anything. All you know is just all the frustration that's in your mind because you don't know how to connect with people and build things. So those of us who are out here building things, we know better than that nonsense. There, just here in this town I live in, Sacramento, a few weeks ago, there was a Black Lives Matter march that was organized by indigenous Latino lowriders. It was the most, it, I was crying when I saw it. They had lowriders in a procession, about 30 cars, and they all were adorned with Black Lives Matter. There was not an African in any one of these cars. They were all our indigenous Latino family members who were coming out to say, we ain't down with this. We stand with you all. So, you know, anybody that's confused about that, like, you're not out there. And why sh don't, like, I'm, I don't want to sound impatient to people who don't know, but stop being so happy to be so ignorant. Like, get out and find out more. I mean, if you're not willing to do that, then, yeah, we have to we have to tell you, you know, firmly, like you don't know what you're talking about. You know, if you if someone says one plus one equals 50, this is the problem with bourgeois ideology that's dominant in society. You know, you can say that one plus one equals 50. And in this society, they people say, well, that's your truth. You can live with your hell. No, you don't know what you're talking about. Do some studies so you can understand how to say things that make sense. If you say one plus one equals 50 to me, I'm going to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. And this is what you need to look at. So that's what we need to get back to you all. That's what we need right now. That's our problem. You know, all this stuff. You know, the only reason why you can be African and pessimistic is because you don't know what's going on with your people all over the world. All you know is what's happening in your life. And based on how most of us are living here, you should be pessimistic. But if you look at Beyond yourself, beyond your nose, there is so much to be. I'm almost 60 years old, and I've never been more optimistic because I know what's going on with our people all over the world. There are so many wonderful examples of our people rising up and winning. But you're not going to know that in your little hovel. You got to get out and engage with your people and fight for something bigger than just yourself. And once you do that, you know, a lot of these questions that seem like they're so dominant now are resolved in seconds. They dissolve instantly. Thanks. And see, speaking of, uh, of organizing, uh, oh, there's one point on, on pages uh, 60, 62, talking about, about organizing on college campuses. And you're wondering, why, why are you doing that? You're doing some some talent attend stuff, and I, I, what would you say was the takeaway from that, and what would you say is are some some of the contradictions that you face uh, while doing so? That if to if, as far as future uh, organizing, or like yeah. what other sectors do you think would be a, a a big focus in the future? Yeah, well, you know, although the All African People's Revolutionary Party took a lot of criticism during those years and we were 100 percent organizing on college campuses, I would say it was a very effective strategy because the whole purpose of the strategy was we wanted to recruit the potential revolutionary African intelligentsia because we, we know that what our people lack are correct ideas like people 
don't understand this. Like they think, well, the problem is we don't have enough doctors. The problem is we don't have enough lawyers. We don't have enough teachers. We got plenty of doctors. We got plenty of lawyers. We got plenty of teachers, but most of them are committed to the capitalist system, not to really educating our children the way they need to be educated, not to really representing our people the way they really need to be represented, not to really curing our and healing our people the way they need to be healed and, and, and cured. So the problem is not that we don't have these people in practical positions. The problem is that we have the wrong ideology guiding our actions. So strategically speaking, a way to address that was to recruit people who could be effective at spreading ideas on a mass level. So it makes sense historically, because if you look at our movements, students have always played a role in our movements. The Civil Rights Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Student Sit-Ins, all of that was a critical feature of that. The movements for independence in Africa were always uh, heavily engaged by students. Kwame Nkrumah went to school here at Lincoln University in Philadelphia, what pledged Phi Beta Sigma. He was a student that did that. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party at Merritt College in Oakland. That's there's no question about that, you all. The Revolutionary Action Movement was formed by students. There's no question about that. And it doesn't mean the confusion has been people think when we say that, that it means you have to go to college to be revolutionary intelligence. No, it means someone who is studying these ideas. So someone like Malcolm X, even though he only went through the eighth grade, no question that he's intelligentsia. Marcus Garvey, no question that he's intelligentsia. But people cannot refute the fact that Asada Shakur joined the Black Panther Party while going to City College, New York. That's a fact. So we just thought, it made sense to go to where these people are and try to recruit as many of them as we could. That's how I got recruited. I was a college student and that's how I got recruited. So people say, well, what did it do to do that? Well, here's what it did. When I joined the party in 1984, nobody, our people were not calling themselves African and the party had a program. We're going to we're going to make our people understand that we're African. And I understand the contradictions we have with the confusion and everything, but Today, you cannot argue that a large portion of our people understand that we have a connection to Africa. You can't argue that. And that's been as a result of that work. Another thing is when I started in the party, the first event I organized, it was in June of 1984. I will never forget it. Is there were no there was no internet, there was no computers. We had we had a a, a real to real film on the assassination of Fred Hampton. The uh, chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party chapter and Mark Clark, the deputy chairman, deputy minister there. And we had a real to real film and we showed it on campus, California State University campus here in Sacramento. And we made a flyer the way we used to make flyers. You all, we cut words out of the newspaper and paste them to a page. And that's what we did. And I passed out the flyer. I went to pass out the flyers on my own. I was scared to death. I had never done that before. And I encountered this group of Africans and the flyer read, the U.S. government killed Fred Hampton. And the brother took the flyer and he said, well, you can't prove that. And he was indignant with me. Now, today, if I said the U.S. government killed Fred Hampton, no, nobody's going to argue that. Nobody, well, everybody knows that. I even, there's a film that I saw years ago. It was, I think, Alien, Alien versus the Predator, right? That, that film. And in the film, if people have seen that film, there's a scene where the uh, they're in a Humvee and they're trying to escape the aliens. And they, they say, well, we're going, they, the military tells them, go downtown and you'll be rescued. And the woman in the Humvee says, that's, that's not going to work. If we go downtown, we're going to die. We need to go away from downtown. And the woman, the other woman in the van says, well, they told us to go downtown. The government wouldn't lie to us. And I saw that movie. I was in the theater. And, and when she said that, everybody in the theater laughed. Right. Because people today know the government lies to you all the time. But back then, when I joined the party, people believed the government. People believed the FBI was a principled organization. People believe that. And the only reason why people don't believe those things now is because of the work, not only the APRP, but many organizations. And that work was facilitated through the skills people gained through the college campus. So we're not against 
education. We just want the education to be used to liberate our people. France Fanon was a psychiatrist. Fidel Castro was a lawyer. Che Guevara was a doctor. That's what we want. We want people like that to gain those steel skills and use them to advance revolution. Yeah, yeah, those those are you're you're on fire right now. <laughs> I don't know. We need like a a, a blaze button here, but um, I th- I see here you uh you make a case as well too for uh anti patriarchy. Um, and I think uh you know I think that's something that people don't really understand in regards to patriarchal order and why we need to fight against it. Um, and I think historically all the progressive uh, revolutionary organizations like the PAIGC have fought against or continue to fight against it. Uh, maybe you could explain uh, the case you made in this book on why uh, we need to be fighting against patriarchy. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is I think it's related to this uh, confusion around who we are as African people. Um, a lot of this is rooted in a lack of, you know, organized study and, and real deep deeper understandings of history so because of this confusion and the fact patriarchy has i hear this all the time well patriarchy came with colonialism well it didn't it was in africa long before colonialism thousands of years so because of this confusion people oftentimes as i say in the book people think patriarchy patriarchal practices are a part of our african culture which it's not a part of our culture it's it's been imposed upon our culture and secretary wrote this wonderful essay entitled The History of Class Struggle. And in it, he explains the periods of economic development. And I highly recommend it. It's in Strategy and Tactics of the African Revolution. For those people that want to understand revolutionary Pan-African ideology, Strategy and Tactics of the African Revolution, the History of Class Struggle. And in that, Secretary talks about the history of dominant economic systems. And the fact that people don't understand this explains a lot of the confusion that exists today because communalism at a period of time was a dominant economic system. Slavery was a dominant economic system. And our enemies use that against us because they talk about where there was slavery in Africa. Well, there was slavery in all almost 200 countries in the world because it was a dominant economic system. But that's not the same slavery as the transatlantic slavery that has all of us talking here in English in the Western Hemisphere. And the difference is that slavery from 15,000 years ago when slavery was a dominant economic system, it, it has no impact, uh, no direct impact on what's happening in the world today, whereas the transatlantic slave trade is what built the capitalist system. So they don't want us to understand that. So that's why they confuse you. hear people all the time with that confusion. Well, there was slavery in Africa. Well, there was slavery everywhere. But that's not the same slavery that has us in the situation we're in right now. But if we don't know that history, we don't know that. And then after slavery, feudalism or kingdoms, queendoms became dominant. And that was the dominant economic system. And then capitalism, which emerged from seed money from the transatlantic slave trade. It was built on that. All these corporations, all these banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Duche Bank, uh, Lloyd's of London, Barclays, they, they were started from seed money, from slavery. The entire insurance industry, Aetna Insurance, New York Life, they started by people would insure our ancestors because they were property, just like you insure your house and your car today. Brooks Brothers, I saw a brother, he had on a Brooks Brothers suit. And he's like, I got this Brooks Brothers suit. And I'm like, well, you know, you're not the first African to wear their clothes because they started by making clothes for our people to wear when we were picking cotton on the plantation and when we were picking sugar cane in the Caribbean. So, you know, we don't know our history, so we don't know that. But this is how this entire system was built. And so patriarchy is a part of that because as Secretary explains, it evolved under when slavery became the dominant economic system in the world because men, primarily men, figured out that they could dominate other human beings and make them work for them and create wealth for them. And so this is when class structures were developed because people began to understand, well, I could subjugate this person under me and steal all their wealth and then I can own it. And then feudalism was an advancement upon that because then it was just like one king or queen. It's like, I make everybody work for me. But this system of slavery in- introduced this concept of oppressing women, physically dominating women and creating a systemic way to do that. And all of the institutions at that time, we're talking about 15,000 years ago, were organized 
to support this process. Patriarchy became the dominant method, and people saw it in the Coming to America 2 movie that just came out. Like, the whole premise of that movie was that Eddie Murphy was playing the prince, the king, and his daughter should have been the next in line because he, you know, he didn't know he had any sons, and he finds out he has a son here in the U.S., Pan-Africanism, and we don't, we watch this stuff, we don't even see what's going on. That's a clear, that's a clear uh, uh, affirmation of Pan-Africanism right there, and patriarchy, because the daughter was prohibited from being the next in line leader strictly because she was a woman, not because she was not qualified. So that's why we're against that. That's clearly not a good thing. Even if you watch the movie and saw that, you know, that's not right. If she's qualified, she should be able to have that position. She was more qualified than the than her brother. So this is what we're against. And people want to, you know, conflate it and make it about all these other things. I get attacked about the, my anti-patriarchy writings more than anything else that I write about by African people. Because we don't, you know, we don't want to, we want to hold, and a lot of, you know, patriarchy is an institutional system, you know, so that means women identifying people are patriarchal, just like Africans promote white supremacy, you know, it's a system, it's not about like people are, well, he's, he's, uh, He's black. He can't be racist. Well, yeah, he can against his own people because he can perpetuate white supremacy against his own people. Well, as women perpetuate patriarchy every day, my mother raised me. She used to tell me she was from Louisiana. She used to tell me, don't son, don't get no black woman. Don't get no black woman. They're evil. They'll put a hex on you. That's what she used to tell me when I was growing up because that was her upbringing. And she was the one. My father didn't tell me that he was patriarchal, too. But I'm saying like this is if, if you think that's positive, then then you then we need to as a minister once said years ago we need to just have a lot more funerals to get a bunch of them backward thinking people out the way because that's 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 a backward system we need to evaluate that based on and move forward and say that we want a system where people are egalitarian which is a part of our culture where people are able to make their contribution have a full opportunity to make their contribution to society based on their ability not based on who they are you know, this brother was telling me years ago, why well, she needs to obey me. He didn't have a job. The sister he's married to had a job. She called us over there because he was hitting her. And we told her, told him he had to go. And he's like, well, she should obey me. And I'm like, based on what? You don't bring anything positive into her life. Well, the Bible, this is what he said, the book of Ephesians. I said, well, there can't be no affirmative action when it comes to justice. Like, you don't just get that because of affirmative action. You don't do anything to enrich your life. And so that's why we're here to give you 20 minutes to grab your stuff and leave. Okay, that's it. You know, so this is why we have to be any men, any human being who is for justice, you cannot be pro-patriarchy. You cannot be pro-homophobia. You can't be those things. And a lot of us are confused about that. Now, I'm a what they call cisgendered heterosexual man, period. But I recognize that anytime we say, well, this group of people can't be a part of our building effort, then we're doomed for failure. Because where does that stop? So if it's now, if it's today, if it's LGBTQ Africans can't be a part of our work, then what is it tomorrow? If you're overweight, you can't be a part of it. If you stutter, you can't be a part of it. If you if you're alcoholic, you can't be like that. That's a dang slippery slope. The only unity is a unity that says we embrace all of our people. Period. Because that's what a nation is. It's not just one kind of group of people. I don't want to be a part of your religion. I don't want to be a part of no religion. So we have to have a nation that gives room for people to be Christians, Jews, Muslims, Santeria, Ibu, atheists, whatever you want to be. And the minute you start saying, well, no, that's not acceptable, then we will never have unity. So that's why patriarchy has got to go. Homophobia has got to go. White supremacy has got to go. And the only thing that can exist is a society where we can reach our full potential as human beings. Big time. Uh, you know, one, one point uh, I want to ask about is, I know you uh, recently had this book, uh, have you had any, or, or what examples have 
of people, have you got any examples of people who read the book and, and put this into practice and, how, and what uh, experiences have they shared, like some of the, uh, their, their positive criticisms and self-criticisms? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So since the book has come out, it's, it's selling very well uh, just based on um, word of mouth. You know, people, they see it as a toolkit and they're sharing it. And I, as a result, people are reaching out to me and contacting me. And so I've done workshops around the book to help people get started. I've done, I did it for a group of activists in the Denver, Colorado area. I did it for some folks in Canada. I've done it for some folks in Seattle, in Atlanta, and here in California, um, working with some people. So that, that is happening. And what they're doing is they're just simply, att- I have one tomorrow morning, in fact, where people are trying to use the concepts in the book to get together and build groups to build capacity. And uh, some of these groups are African, some are indigenous, some are European. It doesn't matter, you know, and they're all doing that. So what I'm telling him is like the book says, you just get one or two other people and we can build something. We can do it. You know, I've experienced that. You don't need 30 people to start. You don't need all of that. You just need one or two dedicated people and we can build something. So that's the premise of the book. And so people are, you know, they're going through the steps and then they come back to me and they're like, well, how, what about debriefing this and then take them through that? And that's fine. You know, that's what the process is, because what I wanted to do with writing this book, we need to get everybody in an organization. It doesn't matter if they're in the APRP right now. That's not that's not strategically how you approach that. We need to get everyone in any kind of organization. We need to get everybody organized. As I said earlier, once they get involved, then they can understand the next step that they need to take. But the first step is we got to get people engaged. It's like our people, we got it so twisted. You know, back in 2015 and back in 95, you know, the APRP participated in the Nation of Islam's Million Man March. And both times people, a lot of our people, why are you doing that? Farrakhan's this, he, he killed Malcolm X, all this nonsense, right? So it's like my response and our response was, so can you, you can't even get five people to come to a barbecue in your backyard. And this man has got 2 million people together, 2 million African people. And you're telling me that I should not go there? Because of what warped thinking that you have, I'm going there to talk to those two million people. I'm not I, much respect to the Nation of Islam because when I was growing up, they were in our neighborhood talking to us, and I cannot say that I'm the person I am today without their influence. They've influenced every African in this country. I don't care whether people admit it or not. They have influenced you because they have been around for 85 years and they've been doing this work. But I'm not going to join the Nation of Islam. That's not my ideology and what I want to do, although I respect them. So we went there. You know what? That the Million Man March in 2015, we had I stood there with some brothers. We had a party banner and we had literature. We passed out some of the comrades you all know were there. We were there the whole day. Your brother Yaru in Pennsylvania, brother Akabundu here in California. We were there the whole day. And ask them, they'll tell you we passed out thousands of pieces of literature there. I mean, I passed out close to that amount just myself. And they did the same. And we talked to thousands of people about our Pan-African work. So you're telling me that the only person who would say something about us going there, they don't understand that part of it. You know, and I heard Minister Farrakhan speaking, but I didn't, beyond I've heard Minister Farrakhan speak a dozen times. I, I wasn't going there just to sit and hear him speak. That's what these people do because they're not involved in anything i was going there to do what we do organize and he got two million people there so we're going to take advantage of that to organize and anybody that doesn't see that that's because you're not involved and you don't have the big picture so that's that's what that's about it's about using taking this book and using whatever opportunity we have to get people together to engage and work to build capacity for us to be free we got it. If we just think about it right now, 80 percent of us aren't in any organization. If we got 30 percent of our people in organizations, just think with political education programs, just think of how much that would raise the bar. We would have people much more informed. 
we would have people much more engaged. We wouldn't just be spontaneously shocked and reacting whenever police terrorists shoot us down because we would be doing the work. We would expect that. We would be organizing in anticipation to it. We would be better prepared to respond and build capacity to address it in effective ways. There, nobody can argue that. So that's why that's what this book is about. And this book is, it's not my separate thing that I did. It's, it's a part, to me, I see it as a part of my work as an organizer in the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Nothing else, nothing else. No money from this is going, it's only priced $8. That money is going towards work that we're doing to build community defense work so we can organize this APRP for Pan-Africanism. Nothing else, period. So, yes. Yeah. And um, I see here, too, that you uh, you talked about engaging in an ideological struggle. You laid out some principles for that. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, some people struggle with that as well. I know in the past and currently I'm still trying to make sure I, I uh, engage in ideological struggles, obviously in a principle way, not in a, in a reactionary way. Um, maybe you could lay out uh, the principles you laid out here and how one could go about engaging in an ideological struggle. Well, you know, that's where you unite the the reading and the collective discussion with criticism, self-criticism and democratic centralism. You unite those things. And so what's happening is that you're studying material, you're talking about it with each other, and that enhances your understanding of it because the old saying two heads are better than one. That's absolutely true. And so you're enhancing it on an intellectual level. But then you're going out and you're doing the work like you all are doing with this podcast. And so you're experiencing working together with which crystallizes and formalizes the values that you're reading and studying about. So that concretizes that. And then if you engage the criticism of criticism, then you just hold yourselves and each other accountable. So that steps up the bar and makes you stronger. And I'll give you two quick examples of that. One was. In the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was president, they bombed Libya. And to the people who were like, well, we can't, we can't unite with no Arabs. The reason why they bombed Libya is because Muammar Gaddafi, an Arab, was the most revolutionary Pan-Africanist leader. He was more revolutionary and Pan-Africanist than all the black-skinned presidents in Africa combined. And so they wanted to get rid of Muammar Gaddafi and the Libyan Jamahiriya, and so they bombed them. So when that happened, we, we're Africans. We said, they, they said, you can't go to Libya. Well, we're Africans. You don't tell us not to go to Libya. So we went to Libya. And what happened in 1988, we had several delegations that went there. And what happened in 1988 is that this government came down on our activist forces. And so they, they framed and raided this Palestinian travel agency in D.C. owned by a Palestinian which is where, um, from my understanding, we got, you know, we got our tickets to go there. They raided that, and they brought charges against indictments against several people who were involved in organizing these delegations. Uh, one of the people they indicted was Kwame Ture. Well, he lived in Guinea, so he didn't care. You know, <laughs> you know? And they indicted Minister Farrakhan. They indicted Bill Means, who's the executive director of the American Indian Movement, who were involved in it as well. And they indicted Wabi Anini, who was also transitioned like Kwame Ture. He was another leader in the American Indian Movement. And what did it, uh, and, and then Bob Brown, who was a lead organizer it, still to this day in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC. And so what happened is that um, Bob Brown and Wabi Anini ended up having to go to prison. And at least part of that was because they would not compromise with what the government wanted them to do. And I believe to this day that the only reason why someone is able to live on principles like that is because they've engaged in this process we've just laid out. You know, otherwise, like if you don't have that, they start making these threats against you. Like William O'Neill, the guy that sabotaged Fred Hampton, you're going to in two seconds, you're going to go go to prison or sabotage the movement. You're going to do that. But if you have these principles, you're going to be like, there's nothing you can do to intimidate me. I, I spent I developed a good friendship with Marilyn Buck, who is a white woman who went to prison for uh, helping Asada Shakur escape. And when I went to Cuba and met Asada, then I came back and developed a relationship with Marilyn Buck. And I used to go visit Marilyn and Shakur, my daughter. We used to go visit her. 
And I know I never asked Marilyn about this because I, I studied the history. I know she went to nine parole board hearings and all she had to do was give them names of people who helped with Asad Shakur and she probably would have gotten out of prison. And she refused to do that. She stayed in prison 33 years. She got out of prison in 2010, two weeks before she died from cancer. And, she, and I know Marilyn. I know she would have. That's how she wanted it, as opposed to bowing down to them and cooperating against our sister in Cuba, Asada Shakur. She would never do that. But that comes from principles that you have to gain. And the last example that I'll give is related to, you know, this kind of the similar thing is that we, we, you know, you go through all this work and you engage it and you engage it and you struggle and you struggle and you have to constantly uh, challenge yourself and learn how to do that. So in 2018, do I have time to just tell this really quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, about time. So, yeah. so in 2018 was the 50-year commemoration of Kwame Nkrumah writing the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare which I believe this, a guide for organizing defense against white supremacist, patriarchal and fascist violence is in my humble view, a, a, a quiet addendum to Nkrumah's land book, handbook of revolutionary warfare. So we, we had a conference in Ghana. And so what we had there is we had, uh, you know, in the handbook, Nkrumah talks about uniting all of the Pan-African forces on the ground who agree with one unified socialist Africa as the Pan-African is subjective, as you define in the beginning of the show. And so for us, that means like the Pan-African is Congress of Azania or what they call South Africa. So they had representatives there in Ghana where this took place. Um, the Amilcar Cabral Ideological School in Nigeria, they had representatives there in Ghana. Um, obviously, the PAIGC. Uh, the African Party of Independence of Guinea-Bissau, they had an official delegation there. Um, Amilcar Cabral, who founded the PIIGC, was one of all those, also one of the co-founders of the APRP. So they had their delegation there. And then we also had Azapo, the Azanian People's Organization in Azania. They had folks. So they had all folks from those organizations, our sister parties, there in Ghana for this conference. And then we had people from APRP chapters in Tanzania, Kenya, um, let's see, Ghana, obviously they were hosting, um, Canada, and here in the United States. And so we were all there. There were dozens of us there. And so there was another Pan-African conference that was hosted by another organization that was there, and we registered and we had got planned to go. And there was a delegation of almost 30 of us that went and to this conference. And the reason why we wanted to participate in this conference is because they were calling it Pan-Africanism today. But like you said in the beginning of the show, they had a totally different definition of Pan-Africanism. And so we wanted to go and have ideological struggle around that. And so they had, when we got there, they had pictures of Lenin up there, Marxist Leninists, that's fine. But they know that they have to at least say Pan-Africanism in Africa or people are not gonna listen to them. So they said Pan-Africanism, even though nothing they were talking about was really about Pan-Africanism. So they didn't really want us there because they knew we were going to challenge that. So they made us stand out in the hot sun and humidity for hours without giving us our rooms at the hotel. The conference started. We still waiting for our rooms, you know, and they did a lot. They wouldn't, you know, they, we couldn't get the food, we couldn't eat. We went hours without eating. And so we went outside, all 30 of us, to have a discussion about what we were going to do. And this is an example of democratic centralism at work, because how democratic centralism works is you have full discussion on an issue. You hear all the sides. And then once you hear them, then you have a vote. And the way the vote goes, even if it doesn't go your way, you're required to go with the decision. That's how democratic centralism is supposed to work and that's how it's always worked in my time in aprp so we did that there at beside the pool in the hotel in winnebo in ghana and to be honest i was ready to go back to accra where we came from because i'm like these people tripping i'm ready to go but we sat there for two hours and we struggled with each other and it was primarily the comrades from the paigc even though we had the language barrier you know we're one right so they were arguing that it's 700 Africans in there. We have the opportunity to go in there and give them what they want. Real Pan-Africanism, one unified socialist Africa. Why would we leave? And I couldn't, I consider myself a principled organizer. I couldn't argue with that. 
So even though I had a different position, I relented as would be called for in democratic centralism. And we stayed and the comrades were correct. They were 100 percent correct. All of them were arguing against me and they were correct. And I ended up going to the they had a labor workshop and it was about 100 people in the workshop from 40 countries. I wrote it down. I remember it in Africa. And I was the only one in there from the U.S. because I worked for a labor union. And they all wanted to hear from me because they didn't even know labor unions existed in this country. That shows you how weak the labor movement is in this country. And so I got up. Our strategy was when I got up, you're supposed to introduce your union, which I did that. But first, I said, I'm an organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And the people, well, wait a minute, we're not. Da, 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 da. And people were like, no, let him talk. People in the audience. And so I talked about um, what we're about. And I talked about it in the context of labor and everything. But when I got through to illustrate how correct the comrades were and how wonderful democratic centralism is as a vehicle to engage in ideological struggle, I will never forget for the rest of my life. This group of Congolese women from the Congo came up to me, like eight of them. And we had to have an inter- we had to find an interpreter because they spoke Lingala and I don't speak Lingala and they didn't speak English. And these sisters told me, this is what we needed here. One Africa. You were are, you are the only one, because I was the only one they heard in that workshop, talking about this. This is why we came here. And they told me all the struggles they had to endure to come there to Ghana from the Congo. And they came there to hear about one unified socialist Africa and how we could achieve that. And if the comrades would have listened to my backward thinking, we never would have had a chance to talk to those sisters and all the other people there who the reports came back had the same interpretation. So I learned a lesson there about democratic centralism, you know, and it's a valuable tool, but all of these things are a part of ideological development and they work and they're effective if used properly. Yeah, I think uh, my my last question would be about I, pe- I know people have been engaging in this you know organized work game, but like but then they think okay yeah I'm getting engaged but who like who else is who else has done stuff like this like uh, examples of organizations that have done stuff that grow from oh maybe a few people and it got grown and grown and engaged in this mass struggle uh, right. struggle sorry that's right. You know, and it, it's interesting that the common thread through everything we're discussing is organized political education. Because if people study, they get the answers to these questions. And they're not studying, they don't get the answer. They don't want to get the answer. They just want to be contrary. So the answer to the question is like, if you look at what happened in Lebanon in 2006, as an example. So if people don't know, what happened is that the Zionist state of Israel attacked the country of Lebanon, which is a neighboring country there. And they did that because they wanted to wipe out Hezbollah, which is a organized militia group, um, uh, Islamic militia group that is opposed to Zionist Israel. Now, Hezbollah has, at best estimates, about 50,000 fighters. That is not going to be anywhere near enough to defeat the state of Israel, which is backed by the United Snakes of America. That is not going to be enough. But what happened in 2006 is Hezbollah drove Israel out of Lebanon. How did they do that? Well, the way they did that is that Lebanon or Israel, Zionist Israel has been bombing Lebanon in Beirut, the Becca Valley. That's been happening since 1982, 83. People don't know that here. Yes, what your tax dollars pay for, but that's what they've been doing. And so when that happened, while, you know, while people here are going to the club and getting high and not really concerned about what's going on in the world, Hezbollah was rebuilding people's houses. They got destroyed. When people were killed in Lebanon from Zionist Israel's bombs, Hezbollah paid for the funerals of these people. When people's children's schools were destroyed, Hezbollah built new schools. This has been going on now for 40 years. So when the Zionist Israel attacked Hezbollah 
in 2006, it wasn't just Hezbollah they were fighting. They didn't understand it. They were fighting the entire country of Lebanon. Christians, Muslims, it didn't matter. It didn't matter because people understood these people were here and they helped us. So this is one example. Another example is the Black Liberation Army, the work that they did in Brooklyn in the 1970s. People should study this. There was a time when the police couldn't even maneuver through Bedford Stuyvesant and the Jamaica neighborhood in Brooklyn without they had to they had to have a session with the BLA people to come in the neighborhood because the people were going to say, if you didn't talk to the BLA, we ain't talking to you. That's because of the community defense work that they did there. We don't we don't know this history. And so inspired by those examples. When I lived in Portland, we engaged, we went and did the same thing. We went in a community, and this is my own experience. We went in a community, and we knocked on doors, and we did all the steps laid out in the book, and we organized people. So we got to a point where we had 15 sisters from the neighborhood who were, you know, dedicated, had received some level of training, right? And they were... Um, ready to we they were like we sat down and we like let's make a list of all the abusers in the community because they had said these people were preventing us you know they're attacking women and so we only got a chance to talk to one of the people but it was this this african who was he was robbing elderly women and we went with several of the sisters and we talked to him it wasn't me doing it it could have been me. I've done that alone many times, but it's not nearly as effective as if you do it in an organized sense. And so we just told them, like, these people are learning self-defense, conflict, de-escalation, all the things that are talked about in the book. And so we told them, like, you have to stop abusing women in this community or you're going to have to go. You got 24 hours to tell us what you're going to do. Well, I got these drug problems, what he said. I got all these drug problems. Okay, no problem. We had talked to therapists. We had told, asked them, Will you treat people in this community for free? Yes, we will. We appreciate the work you're doing. We'll absolutely do that. African therapists, licensed therapists. We had talked to this brother from Ethiopia at a cab company. Will you give people rides for free? Yes, I will. I appreciate the work you're doing. So we told this brother, we got a ride for you to go. We even got lunch prepared for you to go to this counseling. But if you don't go, you're out of this community. So, you know, this guy ended up going and getting the help he needed and literally transforming his life. So I've seen this happen with my own eyes. I've seen it where we've gone in communities that are besieged by white supremacist terrorist violence, and we've helped train these communities on how to defend themselves, and they've ran these Klansmen and neo-Nazis out of town. We've done this. We've seen this happen. So don't tell me we can't do it. We don't even speak that I can't do it language. That's your problem. You go get counseling and get over your feelings of inadequacy. We know we can do this. The only problem is that we don't have people, enough people ready to engage the work and make it happen. But the moment, but we will. We just probably need to have a few more funerals, get some of you out of the way that are just in the way. And then once that happens and we have the people who are really ready to do work, then we will be free overnight or as Kwame Ture used to say as the sun follows the moon we will be free yeah yeah we, we definitely appreciate you having you here John this is probably one of our if not the best episode we've done so far in my opinion um so do you have any last closing remarks you want to make in regards to your book or just any of the yeah. work that we're doing within the party yeah, I appreciate that. First, I want to say I appreciate both of you. I love both of you. This is wonderful. Keep doing it. We're doing events like this all over the place, and we need to just keep doing it. You're doing great. Don't worry Thank about you. how many people listen. More people will listen. On our Sunday uh, broadcast, we're, we're announcing it, and we're going to continue to do that so people will come. This is great work you're doing, and people can get the book. If I can just say this quickly, the only place you can get it right now is through Amazon. And please don't talk to me about how you don't like Amazon. You know, somebody the other day, I don't do Amazon. I'm like, I don't. I, well, what do you do for gas? Because you think Shell and Chevron is any better? Like, we get it. We're anti-capitalists. We understand that. But we're revolutionaries. And there's no long line of publishers trying to publish no revolutionary pan-African literature. So people like people just 
are, I'm sorry, just dumb about, well, can I buy it from you? How the hell? I don't have a printing press in the next room. I don't have an arrangement with Federal Express to, to ship out thousands of books. I'm trying to get this book in thousands, millions of people's hands. So this is just a strategic way to do it. I don't have to spend any money this way. Now, I do have a publisher in Canada that's contacted me, and they may be interested. In, and if they want to do it, and they have capacity, then that's what we'll do. But for now, this is working out great. You can buy the book for eight bucks and you can anywhere in the world you can get it. And I don't have to worry about any of that. So anybody who tries to make an issue of that, like, you know, if you're I gave this analogy in the our Sunday workshop. So you're telling me that since you base your it must be great to have selective principles like that. So if you're in a, a foxhole and the enemy's approaching, and the only weapons you have are made by Glock and Smith & Wesson. They're both deplorable corporations. They both advance the killing of humanity, but those are the only weapons you have, and so you, the enemy's going to shoot you, but you look down and see, oh, this is a Smith, Smith & Wesson. Well, I'm not going to fire it because I don't do Smith & Wesson. I mean, now, what kind of absurdity is that? You use as Kwame Set whatever tools you have available to you. Now, if some of you out there who are criticizing me for publishing this book through Amazon, if you have a publisher, then you should let me know. And I'm happy. I looked for three years for one and, and could not find it. great people out here, but don't have the capacity. So we're getting the book in people's hands. So I don't, we don't want to, don't come to us with no nonsense. We're trying to get free, you all. Yeah, thank you, brother. I mean, we love you too, brother. And, and all the work you've been doing, you know, for almost about 40 years now, is, you know, doesn't go uh, unnoticed. So we definitely appreciate you joining with us and, you know, continue to hopefully we all continue to build the party and, uh, you know, as we all say, forward ever, right? So, forward ever, um, backwards never. Yeah. Africa must be free. Thank you yeah. all. Stay up now. Thank you. Forward ever. Thank you. Forward ever. Right. See you guys next episode.